بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم مصطفى 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 يا مصطفى يا مصطفى يا مصطفى It's not advisable because you have to treat both families equally and it's a question of families equally financially emotionally all all those sorts of questions and if you can't Allah will raise you with half your body on the day of judgment it's a very very serious commitment and it is a commitment it's not a question of yeah don't worry I'll have one wife two wives I'll be very happy you won't you've got double the responsibility It is true from what some fuqaha say, but most fuqaha say he doesn't need the permission. Fuqaha is someone who does Islamic jurisprudence, Islamic law. In the Hanafi fiqh, they don't need the permission. You don't need to justify it, you can explain to them. What you, what you say is this, the reason Allah has allowed f up to maximum four uh, wives for one husband is this, okay? When Islam first was revealed, people, men and women, had multiple partners. I'm not talking about four, five, I'm talking about ten, eleven, twelve, that sort of number. To such an extent, women didn't know who their children were from. So they used to blackmail some men, well this is your child, you have to pay me now for the child. Which is actually happening now, as well. <coughs> then they didn't have the, you know, the luxury of genetic testing. So what Islam did, Islam limited. Islam said, women can only have one husband, and husbands can only have maximum of four wives. Maximum of four. And that's a limit set. Now it doesn't mean you have to have up to four. But when the needs arise, for example, if you look at Afghanistan, one and a half million widows. What do women do? What do the children do? If men can afford, if they take on another family to look after them, then that is better than the women and children suffering alone. And for these reasons Islam allows. That's how you explain to them, because Islam wants a decent society. No, there's no reason required, but these are the reasons life, you know, um, dictates. So, for example, if a husband, if a man marries a woman, woman can't have children, who's going to marry her if she's divorced? So then, you know, m a mature decision can be made, okay, look, fine, we will stay together because we love each other, but, if, but I still I also want my, my children. So under those circumstances, some women will say, yeah, fine, look, very happy, marry someone, get children, but... I need the equal time as well, and he has to do that. If a man can't have children, women are entitled to divorce him and marry someone else. You know, your rights are not usurped, they, are, they exist, women's rights do exist. To such an extent, in a marriage, a woman has a right to be maintained emotionally, financially, housing, clothing, even, even toiletries are mentioned, even things like combs and makeup a man has to buy for his wife even if a wife is rich and she doesn't need any money a man has to pay and maintain to the extent that he can afford if he doesn't maintain she can take him to an Islamic court and the burden of proof is on him to prove he is maintaining <coughs> that, that is the extent to which you know women have rights in, in the marriage If you marry from taqwa, 
you'll find most people with Dhaka won't marry more than one wife. The reason being, they know the responsibility to require, they know their accountability. And Islam says, marry one person. The Quran says that. And then the Quran adds, two, three, up to four, if you can treat equally. And Islam is the only religion that says that. Clearly, marry one person. And you find the majority of Muslim men, the majority, marry just one. Can you divorce your husband to marry someone else? <coughs> Only with good reason. If you love someone else, not your husband, that is not a good enough reason, either for a woman or man, to divorce. That is a very serious uh, offence. Allah does not, does not look upon that kindly. Can you get engaged and live together without marriage? No, the answer is no, you can't. If you get engaged, what you can do is get to know each other in decent surroundings, i.e. within the families, even have meals in decent environment, it's not a problem. But depending upon how your family culture is, you must take that into consideration. Okay, here we have a question, mother and father disagree about who you should marry. Okay, very simple, you, you have to play politics, right? If, if you're happy with your mother's choice, you and your mum have to get together against, not against your father, but have to try and persuade your father. And then listen to his objections. Listen when he's calm and you're calm and you'll find a solution to that, inshallah. Crikey. Why do people who are forced to marry agree to being forced to marry? I think the reason they agree to that is to keep their parents happy. Providing you, f you see the taqwa right, and these other things, you know, you shouldn't, you shouldn't be too, men and women shouldn't be too fussy or too choosy. If you do that, then what will happen is this, you'll end up being 30, 35 and not be married. And I've seen many cases like that. Men and women, I've seen. Best thing to do is do istikhara. That might solve a lot of problems. If you do istikhara and your parents are disagreeing about who you want to marry, if you all do istikhara, Allah will give you the answer and then all of you have to follow that answer. That might solve a lot of problems. Do you know when you do istikhara, do you have to um, speak to somebody um, about interpreting the signs that you have or can you interpret them in signs? Okay. There are different types of istikhara. One istikhara is if you go to a sheikh or a peer and ask him, am I suitable for this person? And the sheikh or peer will answer. He'll do his own hisab and he'll answer. That's one type. The other type is you do your special prayer, the salatul istikhara. What you do is this. After Isha prayer, you read two nafal and you read a special dua. Within that dua, there are two places where you ask the question in your mind. And during the night, you'll have a dream or you'll wake up with the answer, whether it's acceptable for you or not. If it's a special dream that you can't interpret, go to someone who can interpret it. Are females more forced to marriages than males? Yeah, I think so. Do people often run away when being forced to marry? It does happen. Forced marriages are not allowed in Islam. Right? They are not allowed in Islam. The permission has to be obtained from both sides eventually. As I said, there is a culture in Islam whereby you can marry two people because if you think about it, farming communities very small, to travel long distances is very difficult at that time. So Islam allowed two children to be married without their permission and when they reached the age of adulthood they were asked their permission. That way it was like an engagement until they were ready to be married. <coughs> Okay. A right, very interesting question. Your parents have passed away, brothers and sisters are left, and you want to marry, and you know your parents wouldn't be happy with the marriage. What do you do? You have to make a decision. What can I say? 
you are going to live with a person the rest of your life so you have to make the decision best way then is to do is takhara one, one technique I advise to use is this if you are advising a friend who is in your situation how would you adv advise them? that way you, you keep your emotions out of your decision and that's how you should look you should look at it very coldly without any emotions is this person suitable for me? does he fulfill the qualities? can he be a good husband, good father? is he kind and considerate? is he likely to go and marry someone else? Okay. It is very much preferred if you have the consent of your parents. Otherwise, your life will be very difficult. If you haven't been married before, a uh, majority consent of the ulama is this you should have your parents' consent. However, they can't force you into marriage. They're two different issues. Your parents' consent does not imply that they can force you. Your parents' consent is they should be happy with whom you're marrying and whom you wish to marry. Yeah. Okay, very interesting question. Uh, husband's got two wives. He's angry with one wife but takes his anger out on the other wife. What should you do? Or, or on his kids? Okay, I think you should see someone and get a wazifa to read, basically. But I think I mentioned this this morning. There are ways of dealing with anger in a marriage, from both sides. And the best way is not to lose your temper. The best way is to notice the, um, the condition of someone when he's about to lose a temper. And try, and try different things to try and diffuse a situation. Sometimes being quiet can diffuse a situation. Right? Sometimes changing the subject can diffuse a situation. Sometimes finding a solution to the problem that's causing the anger can diffuse the situation. If your husband marries another woman without telling you and has children, should you accept them? I presume this means the children from the, sec uh, the second wife. You're not obliged to accept them at all. They're not your children at all. They're your husband's children and the wife, the woman's children. You, they, the children have no right on you, you have no right on them. However, they have a right to your husband's estate uh, in, in terms of death. Can you marry someone from a different caste? Yeah, Islam permits it. It doesn't encourage it, it permits it. For this reason, if you think about it, what is a marriage? It's living together, eating together, working together, raising a family together. It's all these things. Now that is best done with a similar culture, a similar background. That's why this is very important. What is a family line? I, I know marriages, a Chinese woman married a Pakistani man, they cook their own food. When they go home, he can't eat her food, she can't eat his food. They cook their own food. If you're happy with that, that's fine. And they have their own different sorts of friends. If you're happy with that, that's fine. These are the practical problems you're going to come across when you have different cultures when you marry. Can you have a love marriage? I presume that means if you love someone, can you marry them? Yes, you can. But as I said, try and get the parents to approve. And that must come first. That comes second. Dakwa is first, looks is second. Through taqwa, love develops. The taqwa is there, looks are there, love will develop. And if every day love develops between a, between a couple, then you've chosen the right person. If you marry out of love first, every day love might disappear. It should be the other way around. Love should develop over time, not disappear with time.
Okay, if a person knows who they're going to marry, can they go out before marriage? Providing you are within permissible limits, you can. For example, decent gatherings, your family is with you, your friends are with you, your parents are happy with that, and you're, you're, you're able to uh, you know, observe the limits of Sharia, then yes, it's permissible. Not compulsory, not essential, permissible. But in the majority of cases, I would not advise, all right, except within family, decent family gatherings. That maintains your respect. Otherwise, people then will point to you and say, well, hang on, look, she was going out with him, he was going out with her. And they won't know you're out, you know, in a decent, re- decent way. They'll try and make gossip. If you're out with a the family, then no one can point their fingers. However, if a person's been divorced, and then you're having a meal to look at, you know, certain husbands, that is more acceptable because a woman who has been divorced after she's been married, she has a greater right to choose her own uh, partner without her parents' permissions. A greater right, not a full right, just a greater right. If you divorce your husband and then later on want to marry him again, can you marry your first husband? If you divorce a person, you can only marry that same person again when you marry someone else first and divorce that person. Yeah, you have to have consummated the marriage with the new husband and then if that ends up in divorce, then you are allowed to marry the first person. In other words, once divorce is there, Islam makes it very difficult to go back. So divorce is almost final. And you can't marry out of convenience. Don't think, okay, look, I'll divorce this person, I'll marry this one, just for a day, I'll divorce him and I'll marry this guy again. That is called, uh, you are muhallil, someone is a muhallil. And the muhall is in, is in hellfire because you are marrying out of convenience. I've answered that. If a person is forced to marry and never wanted to marry and was never asked permission, if she indicates this to a, a, a qazi or a, a, a senior Islamic cleric, that marriage is annulled. That marriage is annulled. Okay, here we go. You've tried your best to compromise with your family and your person you want to marry has taqwa, what should you do? Do istikhara. Ask your parents to do istikhara and Allah will decide. <coughs> Sorry? Istikhara can be for any decision you have to make which you find difficult making that decision. It can be for a job, it can be for university, it can be for a career, it can be for marriage, it can be for business decisions, it can be for moving house. Yeah. Very good question. A lot of people are performing the nikah and then the wedding ceremony is taking place at a later date. Is it Islamically correct? Okay. There are two things to know about marriage. There's a nikah which is Sunnah uh, sorry not, it's actually Farad <laughs> and then there's a Walima the Walima announces a marriage to the male side of the family the Nikah announces a marriage to the female side of the family that's generally the rule so a Nikah is, is, is paid for by the bride or the bride side and the Walima is paid for by the groom side isn't it? That's new pile. Okay. So the idea is once you start living together, people must know you're married before that happens. Hence, a Valima is there to announce a marriage, and a Nikah is there to announce a marriage. If you have a Nikah, providing the marriage is announced, then you, at least you can get a chance to know your husband and vice versa, and then you actually start living together after the Islamic, if you like, after the family gathering. That does happen, and that is permissible. But obviously the family must agree to it. Yeah. Is that correct? Or if do you, you have to read the nikah again? No, if you're happy with that, that's fine. So, so it's not like someone said it was three months within three months you've got to get married? 
Otherwise, you read your card again. Because it's been so long since you, you know. Someone said that. <coughs> No. If you're both happy with that, then it's fine. Providing you're both, as a husband and wife, happy with that. You must be happy with that. Yeah, it's sunnah to have a walima. Basically, because then you announce you're actually living together. Actually moved in together. That is a, uh, the requirement of the walima. And the guy is just, you got married. But then the husband side has to also perform a ceremony whereby saying, look, now I've actually moved in together, we're living together as, as husband and wife. Not just we had a nikah and that's it. And that's the purpose of the vilima. And also, you know, there are married ceremonies that are taking place in society today. With the music, the band, and everything. Is that acceptable or unacceptable? Okay. If you want music in a, a ceremony, my advice is get a kawali. <laughs> Alright? Don't get this, uh, these Indian songs. Okay, unless unless uh, they're almost like Gawalis and they have very very nice meanings, all right, and that that's the extent you should go to. There's plenty of Gawali people uh, on on CDs now, or you can just have nuts playing in the back, English nuts and Arabic nuts. That's what I'd suggest. No dancing, okay. Uh, and in terms of the the rasams, you know, the rasams like Mendi and this and that. Most of these don't go against Islamic Sharia, so most of these are permissible. You can't say to someone, this is a Hindu custom. It's actually a universal custom now. Like a wedding cake is not a Christian custom, it's a universal custom. So you can have a wedding cake, you can have rings exchanged, it's not a problem. You can have gifts exchanged, it's not a problem. But don't make it so that it becomes a burden. A marriage with a burden is removed of blessing. So if you make it a burdensome on each other, all right, you must provide 35 suits. Okay, I must provide, you know, and then they say, well, I want a suit from him as well because I'm the brother and I want this. That becomes a burden and that removes a blessing. Sorry. I'm just going to ask, so people say that you know, like engagement parties you have where the potential bride and woman together that exchange dreams. You say that Islam is not correct because they seem not to get any interaction before marriage. Yeah, provo- providing, providing the interaction is decent, you're allowed to interact because you're allowed to get to know each other before marriage, up to a point. As long as you fulfill the, the requirements of decency and within the family gathering, that's permissible. So for example, if you're engaged, you're permitted to speak to the, your partner on the phone, write to him and meet in family gatherings because end of the day you're getting to know each other. And you're doing it decently with your parents' consent. And that is permissible. Not compulsory, it's permissible. The Prophet also said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, before you marry, you must see the person you're marrying. Remember, it's a lifetime decision here. Does that involve being alone with somebody? Or? No. As I, said, as I said, the restrictions are this. If you're not married to someone, a non-mahram, he remains your non-mahram until the nikah is performed. So you should not be alone with him until after the nikah. Then it's permissible. If the husband's second wife dies, do you have to take care of the kids? You don't have to. It's his responsibility. At the end of the day, you know, it's your decision and you want to be a decent, go- good person. So that's, that's entirely up to you. That's written twice. Can the Sunni get married to a Shia? Oh dear. Alright. My advice is this, alright. Sunnis should not marry Shias. The, the, the cultural and the religious differences are very, pro- are very profound. We try and be uni- united with them on many political fronts, but in Aqidah, there's a big differences. I'm not saying Shias, you know, I'm not talking about whether they're Muslims or not. I regard them as Muslims, all right, except when I find anyone insults a Prophet or his companions. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam then the, the, question, the, the, the question mark arises. What if he's more or less like you? Um, he doesn't really follow his like, family in that sense. Um, if he's a Sunni... No, he's a Shia, but he, he doesn't... I mean, the same... He's got the same language, the same... They read the same way, and he doesn't really follow yeah. like, his own background. 
Yeah, then if he's a, if he's a Sunni and he's following like a Sunni, then there's then that's a difference. But the, the actual practices of a Shia are very different to the practice of a Sunni. And the communities <coughs> and the families and the friends are very, very different. Is so No. You can't make general comments like that. All you can say is this. You must judge the caliber of the person. If the caliber of the person is such that they're very close to your Akidah, then, you know, that is a judgment you must make. Okay. If someone's parents want their children to divorce a person they've married, Okay, uh, here, here are parents, okay, this is a case, some parents want their daughter or son to be divorced to marry someone else. That's not allowed. Divorce is only allowed with very, very good reason. And to say, I don't like this habit or that habit, that's not a good reason. The reasons for divorce are, for example, someone is unfaithful, that is grounds for divorce. Someone can't bear children, male or female, that is grounds for divorce. Someone becomes non-Muslim, you're automatically divorced. For the sake of the children, should you stay in a marriage which is not, which is, does not seem to be working at all? It's a very common question. Okay, um, providing you find someone with taqwa, that problem won't be that serious. People will stay together for the sake of the children, because people love Islam more than they love you, basically, and the other way around. And you love Islam more than you love your husband. So, you know, your love between yourselves is secondary to the, the love of Deen. That's why that's so important. But yes, if you can manage to stay together for the sake of the children, then you can separate later on. If, if divorce is, you know, ha is on the cards. Because children in a divorce or children in a single parent family do suffer. They suffer emotionally and they suffer mentally. <coughs> oh dear. Okay, how far can you go towards a person you intend to marry, which you're engaged to, but you're not actually married to? You have to keep a certain distance respect. All right? For example, you can't be alone with that person. You can't speak about certain things with that person. You have to remember that person is a non-mahram even though you're engaged. So the extent you can go to is the extent you'd go to with like a normal family member. That is the extent in terms of speaking, in terms of topics. You have to be professional in that. Okay? Alright, very good question. You have a daughter, your husband wants a son, so he decides to divorce you. That is not grounds for a divorce. <coughs> not at all. The Prophet said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the man who raises two daughters with manners and gives them, finds them good uh, husbands in marriage, he and I will enter paradise together and he put his fingers together like this. To ra Raising daughters is such a blessing in Islam. And having daughters brings tremendous blessing in, in a family. Tremendous risk, it brings risk in a family. End of the day, if you raise a daughter, you raise a community. If you raise a son, you just raise one person. If your husband is hiding something from you, what should you do? I can't answer that question. Okay. Husband has two wives, does not treat them both the same because one was arranged, the other one was out of love. Can the wife do anything about it? I presume this is a wife <coughs> with whom the marriage was arranged. Very difficult. He has to treat you equally. He has to show you the same love, the same emotions, buy you the same sort of house, give you the same sort of facilities, it's his 
Islamic obligation to do that. If he's not doing that, then Allah will judge him. But there's very little you can do, unfortunately, in that situation. That is why I look for taqwa. Before you agree to any marriage, you must look for taqwa. Taqwa is not on the face, measure his beard or his bakri, anything like that. <laughs> taqwa is this, what is in his heart? How sincere and simple is he? How in love is he with Islam? That is taqwa. How good is his heart? How are we doing? Running out yet? Okay. This is a sister who's divorced. She wants to get married again. Her parents won't allow it. Your parents can't stop you from marrying again. It's an Islamic obligation and duty for you. And because you're already divorced, you, you need your parents' permission less. But probably they've been so hurt by the first marriage, they're just fed up with it. However, you have to make that decision and make the efforts to find the right person. Do you have to wear a niqab on your niqab wedding day? It's up to you. Niqab is up to you. Hijab is compulsory. If you're amongst men, hijab is compulsory. When you're performing the niqab, you should have wuzu and you should have proper hijab, including up to the neck. Many niqabs I perform and they, they want to show their necklace and this, so the dress is low cut and this. And I ask them, please, if you don't mind, cover up to there. Performing niqab after that, I'm not responsible. But if you're amongst women, it doesn't matter. You can show all the jewellery, you can wear the crown, you know, anything. Okay, is that it? Does anyone have any more questions? You can't let this go without any loads of questions. This is a very common problem actually. People leave marriages till very late. Consequently, you're in your 30s and you're still not married. Uh, you have to just try your best. You have to go through agencies, have to go through friends, family, you might have to travel. But you know, do try and find a suitable partner. Then you can do istikhara. Allah's made it a little bit easy for us, not too difficult. The solution to this is this. The Prophet said وسلم, if someone comes to get your daughter's hand in marriage and he's a good person, he has taqwa, he has all the facilities you need, he has everything that you're looking for in a good son-in-law or a good husband, don't refuse that rishta. If you do, the world will be full of fitna. And that's what's happening now. People are refusing unnecessarily good offers of marriage. So when you have your children, you know, start thinking about marriage very early and I would advise before they go to university they should be engaged if not married <coughs> providing you marry in an educated family the family will appreciate the importance of university life and they will give support and help to both husband and wife in their, in their careers you can have a career and you can have a family and the way to do it is this if both husband and wife are working what you do the burdens of life you remove from your head. The cooking, the cleaning, all the, all the rubbish work, hire a cleaner, hire a person, hire a nanny and remove all the burdens of life. Then you can focus on your career. You're at, children are at school, you're at work, when they come home make sure you're at home as well. And that way you can have a good career and a good family life. And nowadays more and more companies are allowing this to happen. You can work two, three days a week as an accountant, as a dentist, as a doctor, as a secretary, as whatever you like, and you can still have a ha happy family life. And that's the way to do it. Not when the kids are really small, they need your input. Once they start full-time school, then you're free during the day, your two salaries coming in, hire a cleaner, hire a nanny, remove all the burdens, let them do the washing, ironing, cleaning, and you can spend quality time at home. That's the way to do it. Oh dear. What if a woman gets married to a person older than her parents? Okay, let me answer this.
let me answer this. When you get married, you have a duty to your children. If you marry a man who's a lot older than you, it's very likely, not, it's not uh, certain, but it's very likely he will die and you'll be left with the children. The children will, will then be without a father. And you might have to marry again. You have to consider age from this practical point of view. You may be in love with someone a lot older than you, it does happen, but then consider this practical uh, uh, importance that you have children, they have a father, there's a huge gap in terms of age, he's likely to die, and then you've got a problem. Even if he's rich, and he leaves you a large sum of money, you still have a problem with kids without a father. In the non-Muslim world, it's not a problem, because, you know, they want to marry for money, that's fine. But we marry for taqwa. Okay. A husband's duty after earning the money for the household is to spend time with his wife and children and assist them at home. Very important, very difficult to do right? because of the burdens of life, but it is very important. The time will come for him when the kids will, he'll, he'll turn up at home, the kids are 14, 15, they won't even recognize him, they won't even know him, he won't even know them. Then it'll really hurt him, then he'll get frustrated. And I've had many fathers coming to see me, they're frustrated, my kids don't know me. And I say, because you left them when they were young, and you focus on your career, and that's why you don't know them, they don't know you. And that so easily happens. Okay, this is a sister who separated from her husband at least half a year, or a year and a half, and he's disappeared, she doesn't know where he's gone. You are allowed to file for a divorce. You have to go for a divorce through a, a Muslim uh, a scholar. Is there a time limit? She said that she's, she's no, there's no time limit on this. If it's a year, you're entitled for, to go for a divorce. If it's seven years, automatically you can get a divorce very easily. If it's a year, uh, you can go through a divorce uh, through a Muslim judge. What if it was six months or two months? Uh, you can... I think there is a limit. I'm not sure what it is. I think the limit is a year or, or nine months, something like that. But if it's a year and a half, I think you've uh, uh, exceeded the limit and think you're, you're entitled to, uh, for a divorce. Done that. Oh dear. Okay. If a husband says the lark to his wife three times at once in one breath, are they divorced or is that counted as one divorce? In Hanafi fiqh, if you say it three times, I divorce you, I divorce you, I divorce you, you're divorced. Okay, very, very serious. Even if he's upset, even if he's angry, even if he's drunk. Well, if he's drunk, you know, you say good, alhamdulillah. But, <laughs> <laughs> but Hanafi is very strict. He can get punished for it in the Islamic State, but it's still allowed as a divorce. Okay, this is my last question, which I'm going to tackle. Very... Okay, to read it out as it is, okay? If you get pregnant before marriage, but you are engaged, what do you do? And the second part, is abortion allowed? There's a name at the bottom, shall I read it out? Now there's no name there. The best thing you can do is marry the father of your child. Perform an Islamic nikah. That's the best thing you can do. Abortion is not permissible except where the life of the woman is, is uh, at stake. Because a child is innocent. Why punish a child for a mistake which you've made? That's the best thing you can do. This was a case actually, I had some sister came to see me, uh, she was expecting, the uh, person was a non-Muslim, he promised to change into, into a Muslim, he never did, and everyone said to her, abort the child. And she asked me for advice, I said, look, if you have an abortion, you are killing your baby, the baby is innocent. Then she goes, well I can't live with the shame. I said, better you live with the shame, than you live with merge on the day of judgment. 
if the fetus is less than 40 days old some scholars do allow abortion but you know I'm not uh, willing to take that risk so I, I said to her no because at 40 days the fetus is is life is breathed into the fetus and the heart starts beating and then life has started effectively the soul is actually in the in the baby very difficult decision but I think she made the right decision and now she wants her son has she gave birth to a son she's raising her son as a good Muslim she wants her son to be an alim she's going to send him to a Muslim college she's trying to find a good husband and she's made up with her parents so her patience and perseverance has paid off so she made the right decision and if you look at the boy now you, know, you think how could we have even thought about killing this boy that's the last question